choosing across the fence. I'm Will Michael. Our topic today is one that many people find difficult to discuss. There's widespread reluctance to talk about death and dying. It's rarely easy. But research shows that talking about end of life can have positive influences, including to help us emotionally prepare for our own and others' deaths. Joining us this afternoon is a death literacy educator and contemplative doula. We're going to find out what that's about in just a moment. She's just finished her most recent book entitled The Death Doula's Guide to Living Fully and Dying Prepared. It's subtitled An Essential Workbook to Help You Reflect Back, Plan Ahead, and Find Peace on Your Journey. The author is Francesca Lynn Arnoldy. She's a researcher with the University of Vermont's Conversation Lab, and she was the original developer of the end of life doula training programs at the University of Vermont. Good afternoon, Francesca. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. Why is it difficult? I think we all have our own reasons, but what do you find? Why is it difficult for us as a society to talk about death and dying? I think it's because there's so much mystery with death. Although we know it's inevitable, although we know that we are mortal, although most of us have experienced the loss of someone that we know and love, it's still shrouded in mystery. And we won't truly know death until it's our turn. For some people, that's a tough word. It's, it's, um, it's not difficult, but I'm going to use it in the context of a doula, which I believe most of our audience knows, sort of we were, we were brought into that phrase with childbirth. Someone there as a helper, is that a, a fair, what is a doula? Let's talk to the expert. Sure, so I started in birth work originally okay. and was a postpartum doula, a labor and birth doula and a childbirth educator. And then due to a number of personal losses that we experienced in our own life, my mind and heart were open to wanting to offer that same type of compassionate care for end of life and grief as well. So a doula is a non-medical emotional support person who assists people through major life transitions and thresholds like birth, death, grief, and I've heard even divorce. And so in this case, you're dealing with death. Are you only dealing with people who are dying or have a terminal disease? Not necessarily. I like to broaden my scope to include all mortals who are willing to start planning, preparing, and processing for their eventual end of life. So currently I have a client who's not eligible for hospice. She does have an incurable condition, but she's not facing the end. And we're working together in advance of that. Um, you use a phrase, natural nurturer. I'm wondering if you could A, define it. And, and in that context, how do you stay energized for your work when sometimes a lot of people would think that dying is just talking about death is, is, is a downward piece. How do you stay energized in this, in this context of, uh, excuse me, natural nurturer? Yeah, I've adopted that term, and I think that a lot of the people in my community, in the death care community, people who work in hospice, palliative care, or just caregivers in general, we tend to be naturally very nurturing. And so for some of us, we have to be really careful not to give so much of ourselves that we are then depleted. Mm -hmm. So I am very intentional about coming from a place of compassion, and I have delineated between sympathy, empathy, and compassion so that I can remain passionate about my work and remain energized. So for me, that means to make sure that I have a lot of trust in the person that I'm caring for. I trust in their inherent wisdom. I trust in their strength and I am companioning them through their journey and assisting them with making their best choices. So they're directing, I am supporting and offering them potentially ideas and information and a compassionate presence throughout. I'm not fixing, I'm not rescuing because that would be very depleting for me if I were trying to take on the responsibility of their emotions. Francesca, I wanna, uh, we, we talked at the beginning, we referenced uh, your latest book, uh, what is the inspiration? Again, this is uh, living fully, a great concept that we all maybe try to achieve, dying prepared. That's not something that we, again, think about on a daily basis. Or is it? Do most people think about that? Some people think about it. For some people, it can even be a spiritual practice that they do daily. For me, it's on my mind because of my work, and I'm also a hospice volunteer. 
the main inspiration for this book is my own death journal, which is what I call my legacy keepsake that I've been creating for my loved ones for many years now, for whenever my time of dying occurs. So if it happens to occur in a way that is anticipated, then they can turn to my death journal and find helpful tips about how to provide the kind of care that I would want for me. If my death happens to be unexpected, then they could turn to this death journal in their time of grief and still find my voice and my messages for them and my love there on the page. So I'm jumping a, a little bit ahead in some of our prepared questions, um, hearing you talk about writing, mm -hmm. um, journaling. Yes. Uh, there's, this is a big part of uh, your advocacy. If you, were, if you and I were in, in a client relationship, you, we'd be talking about writing quite a bit? Yes, I mean, I think it's twofold that I like to, ap I, I like to appeal to a lot of different styles of processing. So for some people, it's really talking aloud with a, a listener, and that could be me in the doula role. And for other people, it could be expressive writing, which is really powerful, or a combination of both. So I do think that that pause and that reflection really leads to a lot yeah. of clarity and healing in people. And I wanted to get to a question about these approaches to writing the, uh, a legacy, not a statement. Uh, you, you, you reference things that you could that you've written, mm -hmm. uh, legacy letters, legacy notes. Uh, again, tell us a little bit more about that means and and how do we get there? How do we how, how do we get pen to paper to to write about these thoughts that again aren't maybe on the front and f center of my mind every day? Yes, yeah, sometimes it feels so big to say, well, what is my legacy? That feels heavy. And so to break it down into smaller components is really helpful. So I lead people through, I just did a workshop at our local library in Heinsberg with a wonderful group of people. And there are a different number of avenues that we can go down. So we can think about eras in our life and we can think about decades. So we need to kind of organize because we're adults you know, who are doing this work and looking back, it can feel like it's too big to take on. Highlights, uh, for me, when I'm working with somebody, we generally start with an informal life review. So they're really reminiscing and reflecting, and it's very unfiltered. And then from there, we can think about, is there something out of this life review that we would wanna capture and turn into a remembrance gift to leave behind? Well, if you're just joining us, I'm visiting with author uh, and death doula, Francesca Lynn Arnoldy, whose most recent book is entitled the Death Doula's Guide to Living Fully and Dying Prepared. I've referenced it as a book, but it's a workbook. And looking through it, there are places where you're asking me to write things down, to reflect. What is it, what's the essential piece of the workbook aspect? It's one thing to have somebody tell you, sort of prescribe to you, take these steps and end up here. As a doula, that's not what I do. That's not my approach. It's really customized and it's very personalized. So I encourage people to peruse and choose and to try and modify. So I have so many exercises and prompts throughout the workbook that are very interactive and very reflective. Introspection is a huge part of realizing our inner workings and who we are and how we want to be cared for. Um, I believe it's the Latin phrase, memento mori. Why don't you talk a little bit about what that means? Sure, memento mori means remember death. So remember that you are mortal. Remember that we are mortal. And it can feel like a stark reminder, but on the other side it's saying, but right now I am alive. You are alive. We have this moment. So it's in the back of our minds to remember they won't last forever, but right now we're here and to live fully. Um, a great explanation. How does one practice that? How, how do I, and now I'm really getting into what you do, but uh, is there a short version of how does one practice that? Yeah, having some visual reminders around you can be useful. So in my own home office, I have a beautiful bookshelf, which is actually a casket that has, it has shelves in it for now. So that's a memento mori piece. And I keep all of my special sacred objects in there and all the books that I might use for my death doula work, for vigil sitting, things like that, homemade gifts. My death journal is on its shelves. Or as simple as I have this, which is a gift from my daughter. It's her thumbprint from when she was quite young. So it's a reminder that time passes quickly. And some people set a reminder on their mm. phones. Some people have apps for this. Just as a quick reminder, you are mortal, and then it's a self-check at the end of the day. You know, did, did you spend your time well? Are you carrying regrets? 
and to unburden ourselves regularly by checking in. I said to you before we got started that there might be some viewers that they might be turned off by this conversation at noontime talking about death, why are you doing this? But for those who are engaged, how can we become more organized uh, for what is the inevitable, our end of lives? Mm -hmm. I mean, a tool like this that breaks it down into ma manageable steps is really important. Also, respecting your own pacing, so not being very forceful. You're going to probably take a step forward and a couple steps back, maybe two steps forward and one step back, and that's totally to be, it's totally normal, it's totally healthy psychologically for people to find their own pacing and rhythm, but also to remember that it always feels too early until it's too late. So to try to motivate yourself gently to get through some of this work in terms of planning. Oh, that, that is a great uh, beginning of a summation with about 30 seconds left. Let me ask you, what, what's the message, what's a final message you'd like to leave with our viewers today? I mean, I think to take good care of yourselves and others, I want to promote the idea of death literacy. So we've largely outsourced the end of life and we no longer are very familiar with it. So to re-engage with the process in ways that feel comfortable to you and to pull in support like hospice, like palliative care, like a death doula, to make sure you have the information and the care surrounding you. Well, it is there for people who want to explore and look um, and, and folks like you have helped us with these conversations now um, in the last 20, 30 years or so. Francesca, thank you very much for coming in. Very enlightening. I'm not sure that's the right word, but uh, yeah, it is. Very enlightening. Thank you for being with us. Well, thank you for being willing to cover the topic. I know it's not easy. And that is our program for today. We know you have choices, so thanks for choosing us. I'm Will Michael, inviting you to join us back here each weekday afternoon for another visit across the fence. Thank you.